Applied Materials has dedicated itself to reducing the cost per transistor, so the cost to make that device over the last 30 years. So today, your average smartphone is between 200 and 400, or it's free depending on your plan. Um, so we have seen, again, enabled by our tools, a 20 million times reduction in the cost per transistor because of the equipment that we built. Now, Applied Materials has been in semiconductors since, as I said, 1967. Um, we entered the display market. Again, we are always driven by how do you get the cost down. So we entered the display market, I think, about s almost 20 years ago. And our thrust there was to reduce cost per area. So probably um, maybe 10 years ago, most of us had a CRT, and now most of us have LCDs, and now most of us are looking at OLEDs, or maybe you've got on the plasma train and you, and you bought one of those. But the point is that, again, and I'll, that's the, the, the topic of my talk, is we enabled the cost of LCDs to go down so that they've proliferated into what is today a $100 billion market. Now, what I am most, um, let's say, impressed with or that I've been around for is our entry into the solar regime. So I uh, came to Applied four years ago when they started to go into solar. So six years ago, Applied had zero revenues in solar. And today, or at least last year, um, it was 1.2 billion. So in six years, we grew a billion dollar crystalline silicon solar uh, business. So in display, and since because the topic is display, essentially we focus on the backplane, on making that transistor backplane by using if certain equipment, CVD, chemical vapor deposition equipment for making the arrays, PVD, um, and PVD color filter, and then we have test. Today, you probably learned that most of the transistors for silicon displays are amorphous silicon. Amorphous silicon mobilities um, this will shock you double E's, are only one to two centimeters squared volt second. So they're very, very slow, but that's enough. Now, as we're moving to higher resolution uh, displays and OLED, they need to move to, mobili to semiconductor materials with higher mobilities, and that's what these two are, and we'll talk about them in a second. Those, those two types of mobilities actually need different kinds of equipment. So um, that's, uh, that'll, that'll, I'll discuss later. So Applied Ventures, so this is the group that I run within Applied Materials. Um, essentially, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Applied. We, we invest off of Applied's balance sheet, 50 million, up to 50 million per year. And that's an evergreen fund, so we have that allocation. We've actually invested in almost, uh, almost 50 companies. I think it's 40, 47 companies to date. On average, about $3 million per company. And we're investing in everything from you know, one of you guys or two of you guys with a design in a garage or a material, you're a material scientist, we've, just, we've done that, to companies that have Series C investment, you know, several tens of millions already in it and are ready for commercialization. Um, I don't know if you will all understand what the rest of this is, but in terms of of what corporates bring versus, let's say, financial venture capitalists is we bring market knowledge, sales channel, even technical assistance. So that's one of the things that we use to differentiate ourselves from the other venture capitalists. So when we invest, we're looking for high growth, early stage companies that are both going to make us money and are strategic to apply. So those are some of the companies that we have already invested in. So they're really photonics, optical, test and packaging, semiconductors. These are the ones we'll go over a lot of these today. The display, batteries, next generation batteries, solid state lighting, and solar equipment. So I think your, this class that you take actually, I believe, probably covers. Do you cover batteries or lighting? No. OK, but you probably cover the rest. OK. How many of them are in the Bay Area? Oh, I don't know about that. Maybe a fourth, one fourth are in the Bay Area. Uh, Enphase is one of the only clean tech IPOs that happened this year, and that's one of our companies. They make microinverters for solar. 
solar uh, panels. Okay, so that's our team. Um, and if you have questions for me or want to talk to me later, then I'll be available. Okay, so let's talk about the history of the LCD market. So this is, you know, not very technical, but I thought you might understand some of the context of the technology we're learning about. So back in 1988, when I assume many of you were just being born, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah? Just about, or maybe a little early. Okay. So back then, the LCD market was actually really, really small. So it was mostly in just uh, laptops exclusively. Then what happened is that a lot of people didn't know whether it was going to survive. There was lots of boom and bust cycles. In fact, I was speaking to one of the women on the board of Corning, and she was saying back in 1997 they were thinking about shutting that whole liquid crystal division down because they just didn't know what to do with it, and the whole world was going, worrying about photonics, so they were thinking they should just focus on that and completely ignore liquid crystal. Well, it's a good thing they didn't because what happened next was that LCD started going into cell phones and desktop monitors. So I don't know if when you, um, you know, I got my first uh, cell phone with an LCD monitor around that time, and you know, it wasn't very nice, it was gray, but it started to penetrate into cell phones. Also, the CRTs that I had um, in college, you know, were getting, well, actually, I, I still had a CRT up until college, but at work, at PDF, when I joined, it went from finally a CRT to a slim LCD, and the whole market grew from what was a billion to 25 billion in just five years, which is pretty amazing. Um, and this will be relevant as we think about whether OLED can do this or not. And of course, now it's gone another double, and actually the latest figure is uh, 95 billion. So LCDs into televisions. So, so my parents bought an LCD television back in 05, and they paid 3,000 for it. It was some Sony Bravia. They moved out here in June, and it was you know, broken in the move. So I went to the Sony site to try and get them another one, and the same TV is $500. So, you know, 10x, almost 10x, maybe 5x reduction, Yes, um, in cost over just that small period of time, and that's all enabled by equipment gains, yield, productivity gains. So essentially, there were three waves of display demand. First, laptop PCs, then desktop monitors, and then large screen TVs. And what's happening now? Well, I don't know, we actually have one of these at work. So we decided not to buy a um, projection, because actually that, lamp burns out. So instead of buying a projector, the CE bought an 84-inch LCD screen because it's just as big. So um, do you guys know the, the difference between HD and UD? No? Okay. So have you ever heard the term 10, 1080p? Okay. What is, does anybody know what 1080p means? Very good. So it's pixels per inch, right? The, the P part is pixels per inch, and then it's 1080 by 2K. So if you, the, the UD is actually 4K. So the, these ultra high resolution, so now you can really see the blemishes on the actor's faces, right? You know, the, um, is 4K, so that's UD. Now think about it, right? Before I had a pixel, I'm trying to get 1080 pixels in one inch. Now I have to get 4,000 pixels per inch. So I got a lot of problems, right? Number one, my, tra uh, my aperture ratio and how, you know, how big my transistor goes down. Number two, there's going to be a lot of crosstalk. Number three, this is an 84-inch screen and I have to scan. So think about, for you double E's, right, the delay that's going across. So it's a there's a lot of problems here that you need to overcome, hence why amorphous silicon transistors with one centimeter squared volt second type of mobility is not going to cut it because you've got to switch a lot more transistors and you've got to make sure they're working. Um, the next thing about the complication of OLEDs is that it's not smooth. I mean, it's an emitting device. It's not a, you're not, you're not, let's say, turning a liquid crystal. You're actually trying to get a diode to emit light. So you have even more problems. So when they go to OLED, they actually use five or six 
more transistors as compensation circuits. So it's very, very complicated in terms of how to get this done. Um, but UD itself is already a pain because you have to do a lot more lines. So, okay, so I said that. Laptop, desktop, large screen. So what is the current wave right now? Oh, very good. So can I ask who here has an LCD screen on their mobile phone? Okay. Who here has an OLED screen on their mobile phone? Okay. Where are you from? Here. Who's your provider? Samsung. Galaxy S, right? Okay. Who has a Kindle? Okay. Who has a Kindle Fire? Okay. Okay, um, so up until I'd say five years ago, almost every single phone or tablet or e-reader was LCD. What's really interesting about mobile is that for the first time in, ever since I got my first mobile phone in 1995, you're actually seeing new front plane technologies happening. Okay, so this is what I was telling about. So the first time, for the first time you're actually seeing you know, e-paper type displays, OLED type displays. I actually got a picture of the iPad Mini. Um, so the, the e-ink uh, was actually spun of MIT about two years um, after, after I left. So it's, it's nice to see those, and a lot of my classmates work there. So it's nice to see a lot of those guys actually make it, but it took 10 years to finally make it. But it's nice that event, now you have other kinds of front plane display technologies being able to work because of mobile, because LCD is inherently not a good technology for mobile. You know, it's not um, stable. It doesn't, you always have to keep it powered. So it's not bi-stable, um, and it's very not energy efficient when you're doing video, so you're looking for all sorts of different technologies uh, for that. So today you actually see e-ink and all sorts of different displays. Um, I had mentioned before retail signage. If any of you shop at Kohl's, Kohl's, you'll actually see some retail signage. For, for me, the concept of retail signage is really, really interesting because it's, um, it's like uh, if, you, if you know EasyJet in the UK or Easy Internet, which is the prices changing based on what's going on around. Uh, in business school, we learned about a case uh, where Mrs. Fields actually changes the price of cookies and how much batter that she needed to make based on the weather and other factors. So if you think digital signage can accomplish the same thing for retailers to make sure they never have excess inventory. Um, that, that's one of the promising applications for these new display technologies because again, LCD is too costly and it's too power intensive. So if you're gonna put a label on everything in the supermarket, you don't wanna put a battery in everything you want, to, you know, you don't have to change those bot batteries constantly. You want something that is low power but does a job and is not heavy either, right? Because a lot of people, you have to put these things up. All right, OLED. So we only have one person with a Galaxy S, unless, which is interesting. But um, actually, it's taken a long time to even get OLED in mobile phones. It's not surprising that right now the penetration of OLED into mobile phones is only 3%, so this is representative. Um, so 10 years ago, the yield, meaning the actual number of displays that worked, that you started, was less than 50%. And the evaporator tech, so the, evap the way that OLED devices are made, did you, you go, went over this? Okay, so, right, so the, the material, the EIL, HIL, HTL materials are evaporated. So is the um, RGB, if you're actually doing RGB type OLED. And what happens is it sticks everywhere doesn't actually go to where it needs to be. So you're losing lots and lots of, of material, and that material is expensive. And not only that, it takes a long time to do it. So if it's taking a long time and you're losing a lot of material, that thing is really, really expensive. Okay. So 10% efficiency in the material, taking eight minutes. Now in 10 years, they actually got the tack time of the deposition down to one to three minutes, which is great, and the material efficiency is 30%. So you know, you now can do a mobile phone, it's still expensive, a mobile phone, um, but, you know, for that size of display, for that kind of yield, you're getting yields up at 
you can make a mobile phone that is comparable and competitive. Now let's just remember again how LCD became a hundred billion industry, right? So what I talked about, it started as laptops and then it went to some high cost niche applications which I'm actually calling these you know, phones and um, the desktop. So I, I call that niche, you guys might think that's big but I'm actually calling it niche here. So high cost niche application and what happened is when it moved into those two markets the manufacturers learned a lot of tricks to get yield up and to get costs down, which therefore enabled the mainstream television market. Okay. So now I'm asking, you know, is OLED going to do the same thing? But instead of, in the case of LCD, we were talking about laptops. For OLED, it's telephones. That's the first form factor that people are seeing. I'm not sure what the new, new niche is going to be. This is a printed, flexible OLED display. Maybe that'll be it. That's high cost and niche. People are doing all sorts of things, uh, uh, designs um, in stores, etc. And what the hope is, is that as they do these niche markets, they actually learn, again, how to get the cost down, the yield up, so that you can get to TV once again. It's not clear it's going to happen, and we'll talk about the challenges as to why. So, in any tablets? Uh, so the, the only one I know of tablet, I think, is this Galaxy Note. The Note is not a, it's not a, it's right. So, I mean, it's 5.3 inch. I mean, I, I've held it. It's not a phone either. It is, it is, it's more of tablet. Yeah, a phablet, that's funny. Like a PH. PH. So that's the one I do know. It's mostly Samsung who has uh, the OLED anything. Okay, now I was over at um, CES. It's not CES, well, it was at CES, but I was actually at the main display search conference in June in Boston. And there are actually two OLED televisions, believe it or not, that are being shown, and they were supposed to come out at Q4. Anybody guess the price? Who said 5,000? 10,000 euros. <laughs> so so <laughs> it's more like 12,000, right? So, you know, you, you can go, and I, we went over, I've been to LG, and you're looking at the, you know, you're looking at the LCD screen, and it's, it's also 55 inch, and it looks pretty damn good, and it's $700. And then you look at the OLED, and boy, the resolution is awesome, but it's only just a little bit thinner, and you go, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I'm going to fork over another $9,000 to buy this. So, you know, it's not clear. Now, maybe if it got to 1500 you might go, you know, hey, I, I'm going to be the person that has the OLED TV. I'm going to have a Super Bowl party and everybody's going to watch the high resolution OLED at my house, right? So that's how the consumer markets are driving, I think, in, when it comes to displays. But at 10000 it's pretty prohibitive. So this is what's been happening to the LCD TV prices, right? So essentially the, the uh, LCD TV with the greater than $2,000 price tag, there's only about one point something million of them. You see the average is really in the less than 500. So more than 50% are less than $500. This is mixing all sizes, so. It's, but the point is, is that the average is less than 1,500, right, today. So how in the heck is, um, an OLED television going to get there. It has got to drop from, well, this, is, this was saying 6,000. I don't think they actually updated this morning. It was 10,000. Maybe you have to shift this up a little more um, to 1.8. That's, uh, that's, and maybe it'll happen and maybe it won't, right? Now, we've invested in some companies to make this happen. Um, so that's the target price that I'm talking about to try and actually get OLED televisions to replace the LCD that you have. So I think our latest, I was talking to display marketing CEO, he's saying five years, five years for it to happen. So in case you wanted to spend the stipend on the 6K, you know, you might want to wait. <laughs> so there we go. So uh, 
this is just more of the same, right? If it stays at greater than 2,000, it will never get above 2 million units. That's our prediction. If it gets to less than 1,500 by 2015, then you're essentially quadrupling the amount of. Um, but this is an important one for us. Even if uh, you get there, we only need two OLED fabs. It's not great for a fly, so it's okay. Um, yes, that's absolutely right. And in fact, aha, technology challenges today. You've uh, preempted me a little bit, so here we go. The deposition, the materials usage, uh, but, but most, most importantly, it's the materials usage. Okay, so let's talk, there's actually other things, but let's, let's talk about that. So um, you guys learned this, right? Morphous silicon backplane, liquid crystal, color filter, and there's also a lot of other layers like ITO and uh, polarizers, <laughs> et cetera. That's how you make LCD. Now, high-res LCD, this is what I, this is the iPhone, it's 326 PPI. Um, actually, you know, your eye can't really see far beyond 300 PPI, so I don't know why they keep pushing it, but that's fine. That's their marketing gimmick. And then in OLED, OLEDs are actually current-driven devices. They're not uh, voltage-driven devices. Um, and also, as I said, you need uh, some compensating circuits for the, for the OLED in the television. Um, you have to put these four stacks of materials all on top of each other. That's a problem. And uh, they're like liquid, so it's not solid state. So this is now, I'm, there are some of you that are material scientists here, right? So you, you have this added issue of you have to put down one material, then you have to align, put the second material, you have to align, put the third material, and you also have to make sure they're not shorting between each other. So there's some manufacturing challenges of even getting the white OLED, just one white color. Now red, you're now putting the actual color on top of the, the layers. Um, the other thing, and we'll talk about this, is metal oxide TFTs, they're actually not proven out because the, the VT stability is not there. So uh, I'll get to a chart in a second. but. There's a lot of issues with, get, with getting to OLED besides just the use of the materials and the materials landing where they need to be. So this is what I was talking about. Why, does, why is metal oxide important for, um, why does it need to replace amorphous silicon? So if you want high res, large scale, and also if you need to go to a higher refresh rate, 240 hertz, and you guys understand why you need higher rates for 3D? Yes, no? So, so the way the 3D works, it's right, it's pulsing and your left eye sees one and your right sees another and then it tricks you and it looks like it's 3D. But they have to actually um, break up the time for left and right. So a 240 is more like a 120 that one eye is seeing and the other eye is seeing. So that's why you actually need to pulse faster. And again, if you have to pulse faster, you need a transistor with higher mobility. And if you have to pulse across a very large area, you have to a transistor with better performance. So that's why you need metal oxide. You could use LTPS, low temperature polysilicon. LTPS, so standard IGZO, which is the type of metal oxide they use now, has a mobility of 10 centimeters square volt second. Okay? LTPS, mobility is 60 to 80. So actually, great. You know, why don't we just use LTPS? Perfect. Problem is, it's really, really expensive to make low temperature polysilicon, yes, because it uses 8 to 11 photo steps, and I can't go in, I don't actually know all the process steps, so I can't go into that, but, and um, you actually have to recrystallize. Do you guys know all the process steps for LTPS? Yeah, so you have to recrystallize this. So you're, you, you, you put down poly at low temp, and then you actually have to recrystallize by scanning a laser on it. Um, Whereas if metal oxide TFTs, it's the same steps as amorphous silicon. And it's the same equipment set, uh, sets usually. So you can reuse your amorphous silicon fab mostly to do a metal oxide transistor. So it's much cheaper for everybody to just move to metal oxide. They can re-kit re their amorphous silicon fabs into metal oxide fabs. Um, 
Okay. So then the reason why you need LTPS or metal oxide for OLED, again, is high mobility TFT because of the high current. This is a current driven. And there's a business reason, in fact, you need metal oxide, and that is LTPS is captive to Samsung. So if only Samsung can make LTPS backplanes, then if you are somebody else, you need to have a different kind of backplane. So no standalone LTPS backplanes on the, on the market today. Okay. okay, so this is what I was telling you about. This is actually a company we've invested in, um, but I'm not, it's a sort of secret investment, so we're not saying the name. But the reason why we invested is because we actually saw that there, this is not IGZO, so as I mentioned, IGZO um, mobility is like 10. These guys were actually showing up to 80 in their material set. And, uh, you know, when the, I mean, that was on a, let's say, coupon size type of display. When they've actually scaled it up to a bigger size, it's more like 30, 40 to get that VT stability. So this is the other thing is VT shift when you're driving at high voltage. Uh, to test the transistor stability. You know, metal LTPS is, is better than metal oxide, so they keep trying to, to, to improve the material set to try and reduce the VT shift. Um, what else can I tell you? Yeah, I mean, the aperture ratio for a metal oxide is better because the actual transistor structure is, is uh, smaller. Um, and it's transistors per pixel. Yeah, that's to drive the pixel, but you still have the compensating circuits for the OLED televisions that you need. Okay, and then the mask steps, because the foldable steps are pretty expensive. So you have to put down the resist, bake, etch 11 times instead of five. Okay. Yeah. 